Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives. With lots of authenticity and a touch of humor, here is your host, Steve Bisson. Toujours un privilège, always a privilege. Thank you and welcome to episode 135. Um, if you haven't listened to episode 133 and 134, they're a two-part interview with Dr. Hayden Duggan. Really, really important to listen to that. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Dr. Duggan, and I hope you go back and listen to us. But episode 135 was also very important because of the anti-Semitism that's going on right now. I, and I, my guest will be Malka Shah. Malka Shah is the founder of the Kesher Shalom Projects, which she started after the October 7th attacks in Israel. Um, and uh, we we will talk a little bit of, she I, hopefully we'll bring up a little bit of 9-11, her experience in New York City and stuff like that, and her training opportunities and stuff like that. But uh, Malka is a licensed clinical social worker. She is uh, practicing in the state of New Jersey, New York, and Florida. She's been in the field for over 25 years with her own private practice for 15 years. I'm sure she's going to talk about a lot of her experience, but um, she is an EMDR person. She's worked with trauma for a long time. She's worked with the Red Cross, um, and I really enjoy just reading her bio. She was recommended by a, a podcaster on the Psychraft Network, so I really can't wait to talk to her, and here is the interview. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 135. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am in unfortunate circumstances, and but at the same time, very happy to speak to someone recommended by Lisa Mustard. You know she's a friend of the show. We love her to death. Um, but uh, Malka Shah is a LCSW in uh, New Jersey, New York, and Florida, right? Did I get them all right? Yeah. And... Um, She's in private practice for over 15 years. She's been practicing uh, mental health service stuff for 25 years. And um, she has a fascinating story, but more importantly, since uh, the events of October 2023, we have a lot of other issues that we really want to address. But uh, as all of you know, on this podcast, I'm a big fan of first responders, and she actually worked 9-11, and probably will bring that up today. But um before we go on and talk about the Kesha Shalom projects and everything else, let's start by saying hi, Malka, and welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be on your show. Lisa is actually part of Kesha Shalom projects. And oh, anybody okay. That, anybody that Lisa recommends, and any friend of Lisa is a friend of ours, and we're really honored to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa will always be a friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> we have a great time and, uh, we can talk offline about other stories that we joke around and, um, all that, but let, let me start with a basic question that I, there's two basic questions from, from, uh, finding your way through therapy. The first one's pretty easy is because I know you a little bit, but I obviously don't know you well. And our, my audience doesn't know you well. How about you introduce yourself a little better than I did? Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. So as you said, I've been in the field for over 25 years. It's something that I don't like to say out loud because then I have to admit my age and I like to stay in denial. So we all have our own issues. Um, we'll talk after I, the show. <laughs> we'll have a lot of, well, I was introducing Steve to the word schmooze, which is a Jewish word of we, we just, when you have somebody that you have something in common with and you're very excited to talk to them, we call it a schmooze. Um, so, I, my actual practice before I was in private practice was very wide and varied. I worked in domestic violence. I did some Project Liberty, which is the post-11 work that Steve was alluding to. Uh, but I was actually in New York City on 9-11. I was actually there. I saw the second tower go down, and I was with FEMA and the Red Cross the day of 9-11, 9-12, 9-13, etc., in one of the mental health triages, which is really a recreational Chelsea's Piers. I worked in foster care, I worked in adolescent services, teens at risk, and I also was a program director for an outpatient psychiatric day program, partial day program. And then my personal life blossomed and I was about to have my first child and I wasn't going to have an insane life of being a program director. And at the time there wasn't as many part-time choices and I always had this dream 
of being in private practice. so my husband, who was my fiance, kind of encouraged me. and then after my first child was born i was married then after my first child was born it really seemed to make the most amount of sense. and i had a little bit of an easier transition to private practice than most people because for the first several years, my goal was a part time private practice. so i had a very successful part time private practice and then when my youngest started first grade, that was always the plan it blossomed out to being a full time practice fairly quickly because i already had established roots so in my practice, i work a lot with couples. i was trained in um institute training. back in the old days, we used to do full year of institute, not these quick little three day trainings like the newbie therapist. Yeah. so i did a full year of marriage and family therapy. i actually did that abroad in israel and then um so I work with couples. I also do a lot of maternal wellness and women's issues from postpartum depression to helping women with um, transitions of motherhood, working mothers, et cetera. And then my third area and the one we're going to focus on today is trauma. I am an EMDR trained therapist as well. Um, very grateful to people that trained me. And so I do a lot of trauma in my individual practice. Betrayal trauma, infidelity in couples has become a really big hot topic for another time and the reason Steve has me on the show is I have what I call this unfortunate skill set because you really don't want me to use this skill set because it means something unfortunate has happened in the world and I had some of the top trainers train me post 9-11 through New in New York City it was called Project Liberty and that continued to be trained in those top trainers and was called in for different various large-scale traumas throughout the throughout the years and it's that skill set kind of remained dormant until October 7th, as Steve alluded to. Well, you know, all I can think of is we were chatting away before the interview and I'm like, oh, we should probably press record at some point. Uh, it really felt that we had a good connection. And then I was writing down everything you said. I've had lots of jobs in my life until I stabilized, a little re especially once I had kids and all that. I've, I've So we have that in common. I'm EMDR trained. I've never got the certification just because of my own personal reasons, but I am EMDR trained and I love EMDR and uh, my kids, my oldest is going to be 16 by the time this comes out. So I know exactly how you feel about 16 year olds and everything else. Um, and you know, my, the guest for the last two episodes was someone who is a firefighter who was there in nine 11 working on the pile. Um, so I have, you know, have that a whole lot. And the only thing I would say is my, um, my knowing a little bit of the words that I know is from Howard Stern. So they're not always like, I'm not sure they're appropriate for me to say it all the time. So uh, I'm going to hold back to what I know about my, uh, my skills in regards to that. So I'll let you decide what my skills are maybe after the interview, but uh, I really appreciate you giving a good description of who, of who you are. And I can't wait to hear more about, um, uh, the Kesher Shalom projects, because I think that's going to be key. And knowing that Lisa's involved is, is so important uh, for me too, because Lisa is someone I have a high respect. Obviously, we just met Malka. I have respect for you, but I certainly know Lisa and love Lisa. But one of the standard questions on finding your way through therapy to demystify therapy, that's the goal of the podcast in some ways, is have you ever been in therapy? And I'm wondering if you've ever been in therapy. Of course. I think that it's a healthy process. I think that anybody who works in the field of therapy needs to work through their issues because if we're not grounded and very clear about where we are and we're not emotionally regulated, we're not going to be helpful to anybody. So just like I tell all the mothers that I work with, the, the what does the airline stewardess say? We all know this. Yeah. Um, Put the oxygen mask on. Put the oxygen mask on uh, yourself before you could help somebody else. You need to be grounded. Now, that does not mean that I'm perfect. Just because I'm a therapist, just because I've been to What? I, no! I've been pushing this image that I'm perfect. What? What? No. I got shtick. Shtick is a Jewish word. Shtick, yeah. Shtick, well, that... that's a clean cut word. You can use oh, that. that. Is, okay, I could use that one. Okay, good. Yeah, shtick means we all like we all have a little bit of issues. Or Mishnah Goss means a little bit of issues. But I think that therapy is a healthy thing and everybody could use it at different cross points in their life, whether it is what any of the things that I mentioned earlier. You know, once you get to a certain age in life, which I have now crossed, um, it is impossible to have not gone through certain life challenges and traumas or griefs or losing a loved one 
all these different areas and then raising children is specifically challenging and your kids have issues i mean mine are perfect obviously if they ever obviously hear yeah obviously i have three perfect never give me a hard time children <laughs> um perfect perfect children but I think it's really important, and I'm just going to take the leap. Steve did not ask me, but I like to tell, this is the way I like to phrase things, is when people always ask me, how do you know that if this is just a little bit of stress or I need to go to a therapist, I always talk about it like this. We talk about therapy in terms of duration, frequency, and intensity. So everybody has different things, but it's a matter of, is the duration of what you're going through and the frequency and the intensity and that the intensity is only something you can me measure and that is in fact why therapy is not a black and white science because it's, it's based on client client reporting and clients are the worst self-reporters um so i talk about it in terms of frequency intensity and duration and if they're impacting your ability to work be functioning in life do your act what we call adls activities of daily living yeah. meaning are you not getting up and going to the grocery store? Are you not taking care of yourself? Are you parenting small children and you can't function? Is it affecting your most important interpersonal relationships? Then it's just normal. You know, I Steve, I always tell people, like, if you all of a sudden woke up with this giant rash on your shoulder, what would you hesitate to see a dermatologist? Right. So why why do people have all these hangups about seeing us? We're not we're not gonna bite them. Not on the first session. I, I take a few sessions before I bite people. And, you know, right. it's, it's totally fakakta if you ask me, but I don't know how appropriate that is. See, I told you I learned everything from Howard Stern. Uh, I, I, but all, <laughs> all joking aside, though, I, I mean, like, I know that you're an EMDR clinician. One of the best therapies, I don't know if, for your training, but for my training, I had to go through EMDR myself. And I remember telling people, not only am I in therapy, having gone through EMDR, I have so much more compassion when I do administer EMDR because I've been through it. Well, I'm glad that you said that. I guess I'm, we're going on many different topics, but, you know, EMDR didn't exist when 9-11 happened. I mean, it, it existed. It wasn't well known. And I always say to people, I wish I had the knowledge now and I could go back in time because when I talk about trauma today, I talk about, you know, now we're very focused on we understand the somatic piece of trauma and how it affects our body. And that's something that a lot of therapists are aware of. We were focused much more on the CBT type of tech, um, techniques back then. And one of the things that we talk about at the Kesher Shalom Projects training is the marrying, and, and one of my philosophies is the marrying the both. I find a lot of the newer therapists coming out of school these days are just focused on the somatic piece. and really that if you want to get a true healing you have to have the cognitive and the somatic and and they talk about how we blend both philosophies together but if you had told me about emdr on in 2001 2002 i would i remember first hearing about it thinking it was a little mishugana you like the word mishugana yeah I love that one too. I, I really didn't, but then, but then I became a true believer, and I, I decided to take the opportunity to train myself. And it, it is what I—I I don't want to say it's a miracle, but I used to feel like I was very good at getting clients from like zero to eighty percent or zero to ninety, and there was a piece missing. And for me, as a clinician, that's the missing piece that I didn't know that I needed until I did it. You know, I—I I think the EMDR you know francine shapiro had done the act discovered it accidentally i think in the 1980s but really didn't become very popular until the mid 2000s to early 2010s and it is a game changer for my work working with first responders i work with the military once in a while the medical staff it's just a game changer for me and yeah 9 11 that would have been a great time to have that skill set because it would have brought people to the other side and i want to just add another thing that you said uh, first of all, we go all over the place because finding a way through therapy, if you expect a, a, uh, I'm not doing a training, I'm doing a podcast. So I'm just like, wherever we go again, I feel like I'm plugging Howard Stern to, through no ends, but I'm the Howard Stern guy. We go anywhere you want. I don't care. I'll, I'll follow you. Oh, uh, I'm following your lead, but okay. Oh, that don't worry about me. I I'm just, I'm just a host, but you know, when we talk about, you know, doing EMDR, one of the things that I, I talk about the mind, body, spirit. And I tell people that if 
you're physically not doing well, your mind won't do well and your spirit won't do well. Or if only two of them are doing well, the third one's going to affect the other ones. You need to be able to balance and it's a constant work place. And, and for me, you're right. I think the somatic has become much more a problem. And again, I, I, the people, this is going to be my, my plateau until someone hears me. When I break my arm, it takes a half second to break, but then I got to be in a, in a cast for eight weeks and then I got to do PT and it could take up to three months. Mental health, I'm supposed to cure you after two sessions. I mean, what the hell? No. Uh, that's not how it works. So, you know, you need to give therapy its due too and give it its time. Trauma sits in the body. And this is treated. Trauma could sit in the body for thir forever, for 30 years. They have it in brain scans now. The science is unbelievable. And yeah, that's what EMDR teaches us. But, um, you know, speaking of trauma, I know that, you know, one of my, uh, again, you know, I work with first responders. A lot of people on the podcast here know that that's one of my biggest passions. 9-11 really impacted a whole lot of individuals, particularly first responders. And I know that that's kind of where you, you wanted to start off with and talk a little bit about. Sure. So I just wanted to start by telling you that when I first heard the news of October 7th, it was one of the most devastating things in my lifetime, including 9-11, that I've ever experienced. Because I knew in a minute, my life was never going to be the same. It wasn't just that it was October 7th. The difference, and they call it the Jewish 9-11. No. No. I'm, I'm going to correct everyone. In 9-11, I was living in New York City. I was a young therapist. The entire world came to support New Yorkers. There was so much validation and love and support for New Yorkers. Nobody pointed their fingers and blamed New Yorkers. October 7th happened and the world stayed silent. The silence and the victim blaming and the gaslighting. The worst, when we talk about trauma at large, we talk about the concept of one of the most important things you need for healing is support system and validation. What has happened to the world that all of a sudden the victims of the no these are kids that went to a music festival. Right. These are kids. Let's just repeat that. These are kids that w and Nova stands for peace. It was called the Nova Peace Music Festival, and the people that live in kibbutzes down in south um, southern um, Israel, people don't. They're like kibbutzniks are like this ideological hippy dippy. Like they live in these beautiful little communities. These are the most peaceful people. That's probably why they attacked them. There's the Correct. most peaceful people. But the world stood silent. And when the world stood silent and then the world turned against us, that's when my heart broke. That's when my, that was the most heartbreaking thing for me personally. We got alerts. My kids go to Jewish school. So we got alerts that my kids should not walk home from school for a few weeks because the, the, the town is going to be in high security. There are so many things that happened even in the United States that just weren't even reported in the mainstream news. My community, there was already three arrests of threats in my area. Not reported. Not reported. So, and not reported mainstream media. So I knew that something was going to happen and I was ready to react. And I didn't know what or how. And then on one of the mental health chats, somebody, um, this came up. And somebody knew my background and they're like, Malka, would you host a Zoom? And I said, okay, sure. Does anybody want to do it with me? My phone was binging from Stacy Shapiro. She was binging my phone. And before I knew it, I was doing a Zoom with a few therapists to talk about trauma and helping and coping. We thought, Steve, 30, 40 people might show up because it was just on a couple chats. The Zoom maxed out of the 300 person limit. Wow. We were asked to do it again. It maxed, the therapist that had the Zoom upped her limit on the zoom it maxed out again and again and then and then we did it for a couple organizations and that was all the beginning was voluntary and then we got a lot of responses from the non-jewish therapists hey we want this training because the original training was for to support jewish therapists to get help them through counter transference should i define counter transference or people know please do because i i think that that's the point of finding your way through therapies to take right. away all the mystic shit. so basically counter transference just when you see a therapist there's going to be unresolved there's going to be unsolved on un, un, unconscious <laughs> unconscious, <laughs> I, unconscious um issues like 
Like, I could have came on the show, and Steve was like, oh, Maka reminds me of the girl that was mean to me in high school. Well, then, all this, like, unconsciously, he doesn't like me. And he doesn't even understand why he doesn't. But the therapist, you know, we're human beings, too. And right. we have issues, as I said. We're not perfect, except for me and Steve. We're totally perfect. Hey, the rest of everybody, you know. We've been working not, with Lisa to get her there. She's still on the fence, but go ahead. Uh, well, Lisa might be perfect. Lisa might be. So, you know, when I said absolutely I've been through therapy, we need to work through our issues both in therapy and in cl proper clinical supervision, which is another thing that I do provide for therapists. I forgot to mention that because you can't mention everything. Um, and we, we usually have those issues resolved, but this was what we call an act of trauma. There's no way those issues could be resolved. And when clients are coming in with anti-Semitic um, statements towards their therapist, and yes, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism in what's supposed to be the safest place is a therapy room, or Jewish clients are going to non-Jewish therapists hearing terrible things or being unvalidated by their therapist, you know, because they're having reactions to what's going on. So we were, so we were approached by, so we just, somebody, so Stacy came up with the and idea. Before, of, before you go on, I'm going to give you another example because I want people to understand countertransference. Perfect. So if you had a, 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 a partner, a former partner that rejected you and the person that talk that's across from you in therapy causes you to like, they either looked at them that or they say something like that, or they broke up with their partner in the same way they did with you. And you start having this negative reaction to it. That's the most typical countertransference issue or getting for therapists. The typical stuff is getting overly attached to your client because of attraction, because of other stuff that's not related to therapy. So identifying, over identifying. Yeah. So I just something to keep in mind. I want to like I like to take away all this like mystical stuff about therapy because therapy should not be mystical. It's very normal. Uh, but please go ahead. I apologize. I stopped you. So. Right. So what happened is when we put those initial trainings and we really didn't have a lot of time to put these trainings together, I spoke about countertransference and we watched other organizations and a few other places put things out, but they were more like Zooms of discussion or process. They weren't giving practical skills. And I feel like I was one of the first people to bring up countertransference and I spoke about it at length and how do we work through it and still work with our clients. And then we got calls from non-Jewish therapists like, hey, we want we want to be in these trainings. We want to be part of this. We need to be part of this. So we came up with the idea, and I feel like it was one of the miracles along the way is that we got accredited pretty fast to make it a CEU program. And one of the things that we're offering, which also doesn't exist really very, and if it does, it's very rare, is we added a Jewish cultural competency to the program. So the one that's for both therapists, we a little bit, unfortunately, had to take away a little bit of the countertransference piece. Although it's still there because if you've experienced any kind of discrimination or racism, even if you're not Jewish, it could trigger your own countertransference. Right. So we added this Jewish cultural competency, and that, you know, one of the things I was telling Steve before we went online is people don't consider Jews a minority. Right. And we got a lot of, we got a lot of um, pushback in the fields of mental health. How can you do Jewish trainings? How can you do... But Stephen can attest that every other minority group has their own trainings. It's just that one of the first times that we started posting on some of these chats and groups that we're doing it just for the Jews. I wasn't allowed, and some some of the chats will say post on Minority Day, and I would post, and they would like tell me I'm breaking the rules. You don't get to. I'm like, so I want to just tell you the facts. People who identify as BIPOC in America is about 33 to 34 percent, depending on the source. People who identify as Black is around 11 to 12 percent. People identify as Hispanic is around 17 percent. Asian is about 7 percent. The amount, the people that identify as Jews in the United States of America is 2.2 percent. Jews make up 0.2 percent of the United, the entire world. So when you tell us that we're not a minority, what, what does that mean? Statistically, we are. Right. And we talk, we do get a little bit into like what makes Jews a little bit, why Jews are put in that kind of category and what are the, you know, what are the stereotypes. So we took this and then what the second piece of it was not just the reaction to October 7th, which is the one that's unfortunately probably going to be around longer is the rise and the normalization of anti-Semitism in everyday culture, not just the college campuses. We're seeing it in the mental health field. And so these trainings had to happen. And we're going to continue doing them and we're going to continue perfecting them and making them a little bit stronger and deeper. And as we continue them, I'm even continuing 
figuring out, working on different new ways of looking at trauma, kind of combining the CBT, of, you know, and am I allowed to say psychodynamic? And people feel like that's- Whoa, whoa, word. whoa, stop swearing mm. on my podcast. So psychodynamic people think is ancient, but there's, I want to remind people that there's still parts of it that are relevant and healthy. We, we just have to adopt it a little bit to modern times. So when you take the psychodynamic and the CBT and the somatic interventions, you really have a much more comprehensive treatment modality for trauma. So that's part one of what we do. And then we really address what's going on in the Jewish communities. We're addressing it by training Jewish therapists. We've invited educational professionals and clergy to our training because people need to understand, anybody who's in a leadership position has to understand the Jewish perspective of what's going on. Our trainings are not political. I want to make a very strong statement that we're not getting into politics. We're talking as trauma therapists. The fact that you have to say that is fucking sad, but that's, go ahead. Oh, but the comments that we get online. Yeah, I, 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 I know I know why you said it. I know why you said it. I just find it very sad that we have to say those things. Oh, I had to fight Facebook on my professional page when I wanted to boost the post. It first got rejected as political, and then I, ha which is probably like Autobot, and then I had to write a whole th response to get each boost accepted into the system. Um, but anyway, it's not political. Sorry, I have... it's, right? It's not political, but we are talking about one types, one one people's experience, and we're giving over the history because. The Jewish people right now are experiencing what we call an active trauma, and they're also experiencing what we are now labeling a communal trauma. And if it's okay with you, Steve, I would like to define communal trauma. Cause Please do. Collective trauma is what some people are defining it as. I, collective trauma is something we all experienced in COVID, when the whole world shut down together, or New York City shut down. But communal trauma is because it's a targeted people, where it's, tar it's targeted to a specific people, and then you have on top of that intergenerational trauma, which every Jewish person has. And now we know from research that trauma can be passed down genetically from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the trainings talks about is the 3,000 years, not one, two, 3,000 years of persecution. We've been enslaved four different times. We've been kicked out of our homeland countless amount of times. We've been colonized, kicked out. And that is intergenerational trauma on top of the acts of trauma and then on top of the, you know, the anti-Semitism and being gaslit. There's, it's almost impossible for not, for some, for somebody who identifies as Jewish not to be feeling something today in today's day and age. As, as my client, uh, who is not Jewish mentioned, he's like, you know, people are still walking around with those tattoos. We're not talking about ancient fucking history. We're talking about what happened 80 years ago and somehow this has been wiped from people's memories for some god awful reason so it, like you talk about 3000 years of history let's look 80 years ago and maybe we can wake up some people i don't know but to me that's i remember him saying that and i wanted to say that too because if you don't believe in that 3000 and i th it's not like it's a belief system it fucking happened but if you don't believe that you, World War II was based on the eradication of the Jewish community. Period. End of story. Right. So the one little political thing I will say is they'll always come for the Jews first, but then they'll come for some they'll come for everyone else next. So if you don't stand up, they will come for you, whoever the we whoever the they is. Because yeah. it, throughout the generations the they has been different. So we have all these different pieces of trauma on top of trauma. And the other thing we talk about as trauma therapists is when you have a trauma that's not resolved and it builds on top of another trauma. So you could have these grand capital T traumas and then we have little t traumas. Like somebody, you were fired from a job, Steve, is not the same as a 9-11 trauma, but it's still a trauma. Right. So you have that on top of another trauma and if they weren't resolved, it just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up. So that there's a lot of pain going on and there's a lot of feeling betrayed because there's... You, Clients are coming to us and people are coming to us saying, you know, I had these coworkers that we used to talk about the game or we used to talk about The Bachelor. And now they're posting anti-Semitic things or they're laughing about anti-Semitic things online. Yeah. And how, who do I trust? Who do I trust, Steve? I have friends that never commented, didn't even, I posted, you can look me up on Facebook. I posted everything. 
and not one empathy of the caring emoji or the thumbs up emoji complete silence and I think silence is one of the hardest things to really wrap your minds around and then that happened in 1936 too for the record right we just didn't have social media so it wasn't right. a, you can see it like that and what's happening now in people's minds they're like well, were they always anti-semitic and it's just acceptable to be anti-semitic now was it always there in their head or they're just following the crowd but who can i trust around me who is really an ally right. because if they're being silent or they're posting things what is what does that say about the relationship i had with them before and it's a really scary place to be because who can you trust is a big issue that's coming up. And, you know, you know, we talk about anxiety and curing anxiety, but there's also healthy anxiety. At a certain point, we need to be realistic of where we're of where we are. You know, I, I had it really hit me the second week in October. I was locking up the therapy office. I so I used to have my own really amazing office, shut it down in COVID. And now I'm hybrid. So I just rent space two days a week and it happens to be downstairs as a dentist office, a Jewish dentist office. And so who's clearly Jewish, um, like a yarmulke wearing dentist. And then there's the therapist. There's a bunch of therapists who share since COVID upstairs. And I heard some random noise and I'm like, oh my goodness. Do they like, I had a paranoid thought. I'm not a paranoid person. And my husband had gone out and gotten us all these pepper sprays, me and the kids. And I like, I grabbed it, but it really, it was just an animal that was in the parking lot kicking at something. Yeah. But we have to be on high alert because there's so many things going on. And it's, and I want to be very clear that what's going on is not about Israel anymore no. because if it's really about Israel. Why are they, what, what are they, why are they doing this to the Jewish businesses? There's shoot uh, Montreal. You mentioned Montreal, Steve, my friend who lives in Montreal, there were shootings in a religious boys high school in Montreal. Yes, correct. There, you know, December it just happened. Just happened. My friend's son goes to that school, so it's you know, there's and all it, these. And, and I just want to go finish on one thing. You talked about big T versus small T trauma. Yes, that's a big part. I want to make sure that everyone understands that I don't get to decide, even if I'm the perfect therapist, if it's a small T or a big T for you. You decide that. And if you think that it's not a big T because Jewish people are not in Israel. How about, that's not for you to decide, number one. And number two, that's very fucking short-sighted for people to say. And I just want to mention that because I think that's what I've heard in, in some comments like, well, why would Jewish people here be worried it's happening in Israel? I'm like... Okay, so I want to I wanna have, have a lot to respond to that. But I, do you understand? I just wanted to put it out there because... Oh, I, I, one of the things I talk about... hear that, I'm sure. One of the things I talk about in my trauma experience, in my trauma trainings is trauma let's let's even step back what's the definition of trauma is anytime you feel unsafe out of control or overwhelmed and it doesn't matter if it's a re it's reality or subjective it's that experience that you're having that's why you and i could be in the same exact car accident or fire and one of us could walk out fine and the other one could have ptsd so it's that feeling or that experience where that I, I always feel I always explain it's like a flip switches in your mind like it, it's in the amygdala and we're not going to get into the science today but it's when that flip switches that's when that trauma happens it's that flip the brain versus uh, cerebral cortex that's how I explain it right so it could be a subjective experience but I want to explain that it's not a subjective experience because when people attack Israel and when people attack Zionism and I'm going to define what Zionism means because people are saying all these outrageous things of what Zionism means and that's not what it means Israel was created as a state as a safety net for after the Holocaust right. so Israel represents to most Jews not all Jews most Jews is a is safety so what is trauma trauma is the threat of safety and that's when the flip switches and we go and something is threatening our survival mode so Israel represents that safety so people are saying all these things. They're saying, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just anti-Zionist. Well, what does Zionist mean? We are right. not, Zionism doesn't mean colonizers. It doesn't mean genocide. It doesn't mean any of that. Zion is the word for Jerusalem. Zionism has been around before the birth of Christianity, before the birth of Muslim, to be honest with you. Um, 
And Zionism, it really just means the belief that the Jews have the right to have their own homeland. And not for most people, that homeland is Israel, but it doesn't even necessarily mean that. The basic definition of Zionism is that Jews have the right to self-determination and to have their own homeland because they haven't historically have not been treated very well in other people's homes. So that's what Zionism means. It's been around for so many years. When they used to say call to Zion, that happened in 70, um, 70 CE. I hope we can fact check. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take your word on it. How's that? After the when the, when we when we were exiled into Syria after yeah. the Roman after the Roman exploit, so the Rom, the Romans had kicked us out, and then the the um, I believe it was Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible called the Jews back. They said a call to Zion, and the Jews that didn't come back stayed in Syria, which was called Persia, and that was also then they were under the threat of another genocide, and that's actually the modern day that's the modern day holiday of Purim, so. Yeah. When you're saying, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist, you're actually saying one of the most gaslighting anti-Semitic comments, because you're saying, I don't believe you have the right to safety. I don't believe that you can, you, you deserve the right to safety. And I want to be clear, the idea of Israel and Zionism, we need to separate from modern day politics, because modern day, you can, you can disagree with Israel, you can disagree with Netanyahu, that's fine. Because if you're really honest with yourself, do you really agree with everything of your own government all the time? Right. No. <laughs> like, there's no way you loved Biden and loved Trump. <laughs> like, you you know, you, it's not possible. And you could love a politician and not like some of their policies. And that's totally fine. And that's why we have, we're in a democracy with free speech. Right. To say that you hate, that country deserves to, to be just demolished or to say the people of that country, because you might not agree with something politically, that is anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism is a form of racism. It's not. So I love the people that say, "I would never be racist. I would never be, you know, anti-gay. I'm just a little anti-Semitic." Well, right. well how is it not the same? Just we, you know, it's just. Well, another, what does that even freaking mean, really? I'm just a little anti-Semitic. What does the hell does that mean? I don't know. Can you be a little bit racist? I mean, no. That's what you, I mean. It's not like it's a. It's not a, like I'm a little pregnant. <laughs> so these are the things that we're seeing on social media and around us. Um, we're seeing the leaders of what's supposed to be the highest levels of institutions say it's okay to say say genocide to the Jews is okay, depending on the context. All of those are going to be the little t traumas that we all experience. Watching these these presidents of these higher educations say this, yeah. of course it's going to be triggering. It's going to be triggering to me as a therapist who has all the toolboxes available to her. How is it not going to be available to somebody else who maybe before October 7th was already not 100% grounded? Maybe they were struggling with addictions or eating disorders or their marriage was falling apart. Now they're a part of a communal trauma. So right. if you can just imagine what that would do to somebody, you know, so I always, I spoke about COVID a lot and I always called COVID like the magnifying glass of problems when people would say like, oh, COVID put me in my marriage break. It's, no, COVID didn't make your marriage break. It was, it, there was cracks and right. it was the magnifying glass. So that's what trauma is. Trauma is this magnifying glass for the things that were already not there. So you either have a choice, you're either going to crack or you're going to get stronger. And there's a lot to discuss, and we really want everyone to become come out of it being a stronger, more resilient human being. But I really want to bring out this awareness that you might think it's funny to do the ha-ha sign of an anti-Semitic post, or you might think it's funny to crack a joke, or you might think it's cool to be part of, you know, whatever sayings you want to say. But what you're actually doing is you're causing trauma for somebody else who's reading it. You're causing heartbreak for somebody else. Is that who you really want to be? Is that right. really who you want to be? And I think and that you, you really up. want to be, then you need a very good therapist. <laughs> and and, and I, I go back to a few things you said just to bring back a little bit of therapy. Um, I don't believe, like when you talk about the, the whole a, the anti-Semitism, there's no such thing as a little 
anti-Semitic. They're, you're anti-Semitic or you're not. There's no middle ground. The all or nothing brain is what has caused a lot of issues in this country and in the world, frankly, because you talk about Benjamin Net- Netanyahu. I'm not a big fan of the guy. That doesn't that's mean okay. It. And you don't no, 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 to- but that's fine. But what I'm saying is that at the same time, that doesn't mean like, oh, well, I don't like Israel. No, I Benjamin Netanyahu, some of his politics drive me absolutely insane. Um, and, you know, like it's it, at the end of the day, that's OK. But now we have a cult of personality of someone I don't want to mention here that's running for president that people are just like, no matter what that person says, we're going to go for all or nothing. And that is what is wrong with this world is that we go into all or nothing brains. You can be in the middle ground. You know, like I, I, that's the problem I find is that, you know, like um, you, you can disagree with Benjamin Netanyahu. That doesn't mean you disagree with the whole of Israel or a whole of him, frankly. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, you can disagree with Donald Trump. You may like part of him. I don't know. I'm not I'm trying not to say too much here. But at the same time, it's just like finding ways to like be critical and also apologizing, which is a, also a fucking a lost art. Because, you know, I'm not above making some comments that might be insensitive because I'm a guy who talks from the hip. And if I do something that's insensitive to any of my clients or to anyone, and I try not to, but if I am, I'm not above of saying, oh, my God, I didn't even think about that. I apologize. That came out wrong. That's not what I meant. And it's okay to be apologetic. But nowadays, it seems like if you say something that's wrong, instead of apologizing, you double down on your shithood. And I think that that's what we got to learn how to also do is that if someone says, look, what you just said there is kind of like anti-Semitic. No, I'm not. I'm, I love the all Jews. Like, yeah, that's- there's, a, there's this cognitive dissonance that's going on in the world where right. like, I'm a good person, but I could still be anti-Semitic or I'm a good person, but I could still, you know, chant these horrible things in a rally. So, you know, there's this piece of like, what? Well, where is that coming from? And I, I don't know what that says about a society as a whole, but like, how could you be these feminist organizations, but not be empathetic to the fact that October 7th was full of sexual assaults? Right. You know, that was a major part of their weaponry was gang rapes on young children. I hope I this, uh, I don't know if we want to edit that part, but young children mm-hmm. and the finding i don't care i don't care we talk reality here yeah so the emt workers said that they had to repair like the pelvis of a seven-year-old girl right because she was seriously gang raped and and she wasn't the only one seven-year-old girl what they did to baby i mean where is that cognitive dissonance like you're supposed to no sexual assault is not okay i don't care period you are i don't care if you're the wife of the leader of the person of the Hamas attacks, she still doesn't deserve that, you know? So, right. you know, there has to be, a, there has to be the, something where we say this behavior is just a, a stain on humanity. Um, and we have to have this ability to be, you know, where, why they're not humanizing it. What there's just this cognitive dissonance of like, somehow these victims don't count, but those victims count. and. It's mind blowing and it's heartbreaking. It's it, you talked about cognitive dissonance. I think you hit the nail on the head in regards to that. Um, you talk about sexual assault and the torture, you know, like what, what's not spoken of is some of them were also very much tortured. And we like to forget about that because that's not fun for, for us to think about. Um, I've never, you know, I'll put a disclosure at the beginning of my, and when I do the intro, but ultimately for me, don't ever like this, this is about reality. I, I find that people finding your way through therapy and my work in general, I hate living in a world where we don't talk about real stuff. So please feel free to talk about anything. But when well, you think they, of- wore, they wore GoPros to show the world. Right, correct. They, so, you know, apparently a lot of the Nazi soldiers would get drunk at night and they were, they were ashamed. These, these people were loud and proud and they po- podcasted it all over the world to show what they they were cutting off limbs of people they were putting babies in ovens right they were assaulting children in front of mothers mothers in front of children i mean anything that you can no i want to say what i want to say imagine because i wouldn't have imagined it it's like a it was basically like a horror movie but it wasn't aliens it was human beings doing this to other human beings and they were recording it on gopros so when people don't support that 
and they'll say, but they deserved it, or what about this? And this whole what aboutism. Of course, you know, of course, we have sympathy for any victim of war. If you think that I don't have empathy, or or caring about the in- somebody innocent in Gaza that got hurt as a side effect of the war, then you wouldn't. That's not me. Of course, I care about them. Right. But there's has to be that. But why why are the Jews not given the same level of respect and empathy? All human beings deserve respect, empathy, and dignity. Period. It, it it's not about to me. It's humanity. You know, it, you know, it, it, I'm not going to get too much off on a tangent here because I want to really hear about the Kesher Shalom projects. Sure. But, um, you know, I was talking to a few, I have a few female clients and I know it's not about necessarily Israel, but I promise it's related. You know, like if men had to go through, you know, the biopsies and the stuff that they have to do in regards to uh, OBGYN stuff, there would be 1400 ways to treat it so they don't feel any pain. Women like... Oh, yeah, we'll freeze a little bit of that area and we're going to go biopsy you directly. And we we don't have any thoughts about that as a man because that's not something. But it, it's unbelievable how we have always like two different measures for two different things. And it's not a comparison game. It's a huma- human game. And I feel that people lost their humanity overall because I felt bad for the Syrian people years ago when they were getting bombed by their own government and uh, and even our government. But at the same time, I also had limited to no empathy for the government itself in Syria who was didn't give a crap about their own people or they just want to put money in their pocket. And it's OK to have those thought processes. But I didn't say all Syrians are bad or all Syrians are good or all Muslims are good or all Muslims are bad. I made I, I can discriminate and I can think about how I do my thought process. It's become very easy to go, well, what about this? What about that? It's not a comparison game. Who has it better? I don't know. We're all going to end up in the same place, um, whether you believe in heaven or hell or whatever. Um, we all end up in the same place. So why don't we start teaching ourselves to treat people equally? That's just my two cents. I wouldn't. That, that's that's maybe a good way for us to move away from these very traumatic <laughs> words that we just used. <laughs> And maybe talk a little more about the Kesher Shal- uh, Shalom projects. Sure. So I call it the project that I didn't plan for. Normally, right. when you start a new business venture or project, whatever it is, it's something that you plan out, you think about. No, we have these things, and then it just kept getting pushed forward, kept pushed forward. And I was watching what other people were doing, and nobody was really providing quite the same level of support that we, that me and my colleagues have been providing in quite the same manner. And it was really surprising to me because there's like large social, you know, Jewish families, like there's large organizations with power behind them. And they did a lot of support groups and a lot of process groups, but not really the in-depth training in the way that we can. Um, And the other thing you should know is that Kesher Shalom, by definition, is Jewish diverse. So I saw a lot of different specific sects of Judaism um, support, like Orthodox Jews, have a lot of support within their within their own sect. We, you know, especially in this time, we have a saying called, um, you know, all all, like, all of Israel, like um, call Israel, like Achad, like one, we're all one people. And this this is for anybody from, especially from a therapist. If you identify as Jewish, this is your part. We're here for you, and it's and we're here. And one of the things that I really like about the people on the board is we represent the wide range like i i might be more on the observant side and some of my colleagues might be intermarried and we have this wide range and it's a lot of mutual respect and love because we're all kind of experiencing it slightly differently but we're all going through this together and we just want to support communities we want to educate leaders out there we don't have no 100 percent where kesher shalom is going but we're here and you know as long as the need is here one of the things when talking about Lisa, one of her pure brilliances is she video, she videotaped a, a few of us doing different calming and regulation exercises, and it's on like the secret, like it's not you can't search it podcast, and you sign up for our mailing list and you automatically have access to that. And Lisa has a lot of plans of what she wants to do with this private podcast. I'm I'm just gonna follow Lisa with this, and um, uh, you should. She's a brilliant woman. She's so brilliant. I was asked to speak at a synagogue on Sunday, and we we did these like a, you know a coping like a self care, 
and then she got a QR code. So you just have to press, you just have to do the QR code, and it gets you right there. She, I would, I don't have that tech savvy. So she was that was all Lisa and um, also Robin Shine helped with the. the um, there's a lot of amazing therapists. So if you ever need more guests, they're all amazing people so that you could have on your um, program. So, you know, we're there when, you know, a few different synagogues and all the different sects have been reaching out and I'll, I'll go and I'll speak and my colleagues will come and speak. And what's going on in college campuses is just really devastating right now. So we're, we're really here where it's called keshershalom.com. Again, kesher means connections and shalom means peace. And that's just how it was developed because that name wasn't taken of some of the other names. <laughs> And we wanted it to definitely have a Hebrew name to it, so it's clearly a Jewish program, but it also has a universal theme, and the universal theme is connections. And we're just here to make connections and start communications. Because if people have are starting to believe some of the propaganda or some of the lies about the Jewish community, we're happy to do an, you know, an, an educational seminar to you know, demystify some of the myths. I think Every- it's important. It's really important. Every race, you know, one of one of the biggest myths is that we're white. Do you know that the of, of the Jewish population, and I, I mean, I know I look, you know, I'm on what's called Ashkenazi, like European descent. The majority of the Jews are actually Sephardi, and that's considered Spanish in North Africa. So the majority of the Jews in the world are not white, and they're all every single ethnicity. If you come to my synagogue, you will see everything. So that's a big myth of like, well, wh- what are you? And I think that's the biggest the biggest thing that's confusing because it's a culture, it's an ethnicity, and it's a religion. And some people will identify with the culture and not, not the religion, and some people say I'm ethnically Jewish. And you could be one or all three. And that might confuse people, but it mm-hmm. is an ethnicity, and it's a targeted ethnicity. And... You know, the fact that we don't get a seat at the minority table is really bewildering. Just because we might be considered, I'm going to quote Jordan Peterson, he calls us um, the successful minority. Yeah. Uh, So, and, you know, we don't have a victim mentality as Jews. We have a survivor mentality, and we don't like to look at ourselves as victims. So that also kind of goes into that mythology of, well, maybe they're not really a minority, but sheer numbers alone. Well, you know, I, 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 I could say so many things about that. When one of the things that would, you know, when this comes out, Christmas will pass. But I remind people: remember, Jesus was a Jew, right? You understand that. And number two, I, I kind of remind people: like, I, I'm from Quebec, and we're six million. I know there's eight million Quebecers, but about six million speak French. We're six million surrounded by over four hundred million English speakers and four hundred million plus. Spanish speakers, we're very much of a minority. Yeah, but you're safe within an English population. I'm like, yeah, but go speak French in Boston around and see how many dirty looks you get. And that's the truth. And I, I again, I'm not going to compare myself to anything that's Jewish. I'm not saying that at all. But sometimes people, I think I have a lot of empathy for uh, what I consider like minorities that are invisible because that's where I grew up and how I, I grew up. And so uh, I get it a little bit more than most people probably. I don't get it fully, obviously. But um, just because you're successful and you think that they're they're minority, Jew- the Jewish population is a minority. In period, end of story. You can argue all you want with me. Um, and I think that what happens is we need these type of trainings to educate people because there's a lot of stereotypes. And I consider myself. This is the other thing that I want everyone to understand. I, I consider myself someone who's very open and learning a lot. I have stereotypes. I got to work on them. I need help. And not because I'm a bad human being, but because I'm very knowledgeable that I don't know everything. And if we could also accept that as a population, I don't know everything about everyone. That's just not how I work. And I'm okay with that. What I know fits in a thimble. And I think that with, when you think about the Kesher Shalom projects, it's important to not only talk about stereotypes, but be willing to go there and be challenged. And not because you're a bad human being, but be challenged so that you can learn something. And I think that that's very important to also to make clear that that's what I get from you, Malka, and the work that you guys are going to do is to also work on that, not to shame people, but to educate people. So just want to mention that. Exactly. I mean, what are the most, the, the tenant of 
therapy is safety and empathy. And so when people are writing to us, when we're getting letters from people saying that I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe in the therapy room anymore. I, my therapist isn't, isn't being empathetic to what's going on with me and my experience of what's going on. I question that person's ability to be in the mental health field. How are you in the mental health field if you can't have empathy? Even if you don't agree with the situation, it all comes down to the core emotions that right now we're experiencing, but everybody's experienced grief, loss, betrayal, doubt, fear, anger, sadness. Those are the core emotions behind all of it. And as a therapist, that's our place is to hold space and to give them empathy for all of that, for all the clients that are walking through the door. And I think at the end of this day is that I've learned that if, if you're not understanding something, I've learned to say, I don't know. There's two things a therapist should never say is, oh, I know exactly how you feel. And no. I'm not, I'm not curious about what you're saying. No, one of my favorite parts about being a therapist, Kesha Shalom aside, is the amazing people that have walked through my doors over the years. And I feel like they've helped me and taught me. You do become a little bit of a jack of all trades. And then when I talk about culture, there's not even just religious culture, but there's like the culture of working in a hospital or working in a Michelin star kitchen and the culture of being a teacher and firefighter, and we talked a lot, we start with, started, you know, I've had a lot of cops that have come through my offices and a lot of teachers that have come through my offices. And I just feel like I get exposed to all these different, and then, you know, just maybe because of where my office is located, I get a lot of Hispanic clients and a lot of Indian clients, and I'm very well versed in, their, in the cultures and very empathetic to this. And it just, I feel like it's such a gift that I was given to like really be able to get a little peek into all these different worlds that I might have not naturally been exposed to you know working with police officers they're like they have their own specific brotherhood and way of looking at the world and firefighters and teachers and all the different and so I it's to me it's one of the best parts about my job is I get to meet really amazing people I mean I think one of the bummer parts is sometimes you're like oh I wish I could have been friends with this client but I can't because we have to have boundaries <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if Steve you've ever had that I'm like oh, oh yeah I I have that and when my clients say that I always joke around I said okay if we become friends that means you got to listen to my stories and my problems too <laughs> oh but, I don't know if we could be friends I'm like exactly and I respect you and all that but yes I and it's sad yeah. but that's the kind of what I remind myself and I gotta I've got to wrap it up we're on the hour already okay um, great um what I would like you to do is remind me of the website again just so that everyone can go and sure. I'll put it in the show notes sure Kesher k-e-s-h-e-r shalom s-h-a-l-o-m dot com Kesher shalom dot com and that will lead you to, and then I think it's keshershalom.com slash newsletter will lead you to the secret Lisa, Lisa Mustard's podcast of the therapist giving some free things over. If you want to get in touch with me as a therapist, I am malkashaw.com, M-A-L-K-A-S-H-A-W.com. You can reach out to me. I can see clients virtually in New York and in Florida and only in person in New Jersey. And Steve, I, I hope I can consider you a colleague and a friend after today because you've been amazing. I consider you a friend and colleague myself. Um, this was a great interview. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking that we're going to have to redo this and do a re-education several times. And I hope you come back. I know you talked about your... Back. Maybe I'll bring some of the other members of the team with me. We would love to come back. You know, and um, please, please do. Um, from the bottom of my heart... Um, I'm very sorry for everything that's going through. I know I didn't, I didn't do anything, but I still feel the, the hurt. I don't know how it feels exactly, but I do feel, definitely feel it. And I want to send that out. And your project is so important. I can't wait to actually do it myself. This is not a plug. This is not anything else, but I want to do it. And I want to encourage the therapists, clients, people listening to me right now to go and do it too. Because I, like I said, that's why I wanted to finish on I don't know everything and I'm okay with that. And you don't know everything and that's okay too. And anything that could educate you in a better way, especially in these harder times is only essential for everyone's development. So right, and all the trauma treatment could be applied to anybody, right. just huge cultural piece, but the, all the other pieces, 
Um, Stacy Shapiro does a whole like EFT demonstration. They could be this could be used with any client anywhere. Well, Malka, thank you. Let's take stay in touch, and I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Well, this concludes episode one thirty five. I hope you got your you. You get your breath after this one. It was very poignant, very meaningful, very, you know, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I've, you know, I'm recording this conclusion a little later on after I, I did the interview and it still gets to me. So I hope uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did, even though it was a hard subject, a very hard, difficult thing to talk about. And uh, again, you'll have the link in the websites for uh, uh, joining uh, part of the project that she's working on right now with uh, the Kesher Shalom projects. Episode 136 is going to be with a returning group of men, a group of mental men. They've been on before. Uh, I think episode 122 is one of them. I think the other one was 107 or 108 around there. Um, I can't remember exactly, but this we're going to continue our conversation uh, mentorship. We've talked about different things, but it's just a great bunch of guys. So um, I hope you join me for that interview on the next episode. Please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States.